That's right, folks. Longtime owner Mr. Krabs is opening a new restaurant called The Krusty Krab 2. First of all, congratulations, Mr. Krabs. Hello. I like money. What inspired you to build a second Krusty Krab right next door to the original? Money. The Patrick Star Show is a Nickelodeon spinoff that was announced on August 10th, 2020, making it the second SpongeBob spinoff and allowing it to run concurrently with Camp Coral. Now it should be noted that when Camp Coral was announced, it was met with an overwhelmingly negative reception. And well, the announcement of the Patrick Star Show wasn't any different. So with the show having premiered on July 9th of this year, along with the release of a few more episodes across the ensuing months, I figured now's a good time to talk about it. The first two parts of this video is going to be me giving context for the show, and part 3 is where the actual review begins, so if you're here just for that part then feel free to skip ahead. Before I get into it, as a reminder, if you enjoyed the video be sure to leave a like as it lets me and YouTube know that you're enjoying the content, and if you want to see more videos like this then be sure to smash that subscribe button, just be sure to get consent before you do. Now if there's anything I've learned after years of watching television, it's that even if an idea is new, that doesn't mean it's good. Conversely, even if an idea is old, that doesn't mean it's bad. Concepts that have been done before or feel very tropey can still be good, just as different or newer concepts can still be bad. And if there's one word I'd use to describe The Patrick Show, I'd say, it's different. Because I'll give the show this, it definitely strays from the norm, it definitely stands out from Spongebob and the Camp Coral spinoff. It definitely feels different from those two, but for the most part, not in a good way. Though I suppose Camp Coral deserves its own video discussion entirely, but hey, maybe someday. Regardless of how we even knew the Patrick Star show would turn out, the big question we had to ask after the show's announcement was, should this even exist? And while one would assume the answer is a resounding no, believe it or not, the reactions among Spongebob fans are actually a mixed bag consisting of fans who were against the spinoff, fans who were actually looking forward to it, and fans who want spinoffs of other characters entirely such as Plankton or Sandy. If you listen to the camp of Spongebob spinoff opposers, the most common argument you'll hear is, this isn't what Steven Hillenburg would have wanted. But what do they mean by that? There's no way millions of fans knew Hillenburg that closely, much less how he would react to these spin-offs, right? Well, for those who may be unaware, this argument is referring to an interview with Hillenburg back in October of 2009, discussing the creation and success of Spongebob. Over the course of the interview, Hillenburg was asked a variety of questions such as compromises he had to make to get the show made, how he thinks the show influences animators of today, and the difficulty of decision to initially leave the show. And while all these are great questions in their own right, there's one question in particular that retrospectively grabs everyone's attention. Have you thought about spin-offs featuring some of the other characters? Hillenburg's response? The show is about Spongebob, he's the core element, and it's about how he relates to the other characters. Patrick by himself might be a bit too much, so I don't see any spin-offs. Alright, well, there you have it folks, Hillenburg didn't want any spin-offs. Case closed. Okay, maybe not yet. Enter Paul Tibbet and Vincent Waller. Tibbet was one of the main crew members who worked on Spongebob since after the show's pilot. In 2004, he was later appointed by Hillenburg to take over as showrunner when Hillenburg resigned after the first Spongebob movie. Tibbet would continue to work on the show up until around the production of the second Spongebob movie during season 9, to which the showrunner position was soon appointed to Vincent Waller alongside Mark Ciccarelli. Waller joined the Spongebob crew toward the end of season 1, left upon completion, then remained on the show after the first movie, and would eventually go on to become a showrunner for both the Camp Coral and the Patrick Star Show spinoffs. You see, Tibbet and Waller are important in the context of these spinoffs as both have a long history of working on Spongebob, with Tibbet having worked along Hillenburg for a long time himself and thus likely became a close friend of Hillenburg. And amongst the announcements of these spinoffs, both Tibbet and Waller offered their perspectives on Twitter, which I'll be paraphrasing, but you can read the quotes on screen for yourselves. After the Camp Coral announcement, Tibbet goes on to say that the spinoff is nothing more than a cheap cash grab from executives, noting that if Hillenburg were to see this, he would have hated it. Roughly one year later and one month before the Patrick Show announcement, Waller goes on to write that Hillenburg saying he didn't see any spinoffs in the future isn't the same as Hillenburg saying he would never do a spinoff. 
Waller continues with that Hallenberg didn't have an interest in making a Spongebob movie, but years later, not only did he make one, but he took part in all three of them. When reading these tweets, there seems to be conflicting points between the two arguments. Tibbet argues that Hallenberg would have never wanted these spinoffs, and Waller argues that Hallenberg was never against spinoffs and has a history of changing his mind on things he may not have initially been interested in. Which side do I think is correct? Well, to a degree. I think both sides are. I agree with Waller that Hallenberg was never against the idea of spinoffs, as it was later revealed that he was aware of Camp Coral's development before his passing. And Ramsey Nato goes even further to state that Hillenberg was the one who actually created Camp Coral. Now, I have no evidence on how accurate this information is, so take that statement for what you will. Though personally, I don't see why these guys would lie about this information, as I doubt people would suddenly think Camp Coral is an amazing spinoff if they learned that Hillenberg was actually involved. That just says more about the viewer than the actual quality of Camp Coral itself. Regardless, I could see Hillenberg being open to the idea of Camp Coral since he, as a Spongebob creator, likes to maintain the focus around Spongebob, which Camp Coral still does. But then I'd have to agree with Tippett, in which I apply his argument toward The Patrick Show, with the main logic being, one, the show isn't about Spongebob, and two, a show revolving around Patrick, at face value, doesn't sound all that exciting. At face value, it doesn't seem like something that would work, and so a lot of work and retooling would have to be done if it was going to become a show that was actually interesting while not coming off as a cheap Spongebob clone. Now, despite which side you may agree with, the unfortunate truth is, if Nick executives want a Spongebob spinoff to be created, then a spinoff will be created with or without Hillenburg, as sad as that is to say. Because at the end of the day, Nickelodeon owns Spongebob, not Hillenburg. TV networks are a business after all, and network higher-ups just have that kind of power and greediness. And it's because of this we have the Patrick Star Show. How is it? Well... Lemonade was a popular drink and it still is. I get more props and stunts than Bruce Willis. The Patrick Star Show is a pile of random garbage at worst and very mediocre at best. And while this outlook isn't all that positive, I have to add the at best part because truth be told, there are a few parts of the show I actually enjoy. It's just that this show's level of writing varies from episode to episode. It often fluctuates from something I could actually watch, to me wondering how I'll recover the time of my life this show just took away from me. So if we're going to talk about the show's quality, then let's start with the negative side. For starters, I don't know why Nickelodeon thought it was a great idea to do another spinoff for the dumb best friend. They've tried it in the past with Planet Sheen, and if you've seen that show or my review of it, <coughs> you should check it out, then you already know how terribly that went. But, to the Patrick Show's credit, unlike Planet Sheen, the show doesn't try to completely abandon its ties to the original series it spun from. Unlike Planet Sheen, it doesn't act as if it's its own original series, as if it wasn't based off of something that already exists. And while I'm noting this as something in the Patrick Show's favor, its ties to the Spongebob series are both a big help and a huge hindrance. I say that because, as a spinoff, we as viewers are expecting Patrick to be getting into some shenanigans with an entirely new set of characters. Characters that are completely separate from those we've seen in Spongebob and would be heavily featured to help hold this show together. Who are these new characters, you ask? Well, it's Patrick's family, plain and simple. Though they've been completely retconned and redesigned, which I don't really have a problem with, as their original designs are pretty generic and likely only work for one-off moments. The only issue is that most of the time, they feel like minor characters to their own show, and tend to be overshadowed by original Spongebob characters when they're present. Now I should mention, I take no issue with Spongebob characters having cameos in the spinoff. It, at the very least, gives us the feeling that the shows are still connected. However, these cameos begin to make it feel like I'm just watching a Patrick episode from Spongebob instead of a normal episode from Patrick's own show. And it's at this point I have to ask, if your character spinoff has a strong presence from characters of the original series, then is it really a spinoff? <laughs> if you keep taking the focus off of Patrick's family and onto Spongebob characters, shouldn't I just watch Spongebob instead? But even when we do give his family screen time, they rarely feel like characters worth featuring with his sister being the only exception. In Patrick's family, we have his parents, his sister, and his grandpa. Patrick also has a pet named Ouchie, but there really isn't much to say about him. The parents are basically two simplified copies of Patrick, except one is female and they both have jobs. Al allegedly. His dad has been seen quite a few times throughout the series, but in the end has ultimately had little to no impact on any episode whatsoever. His mom, on the other hand, does nothing but cook and clean. That's it. She rarely does anything that isn't based on being in the kitchen or doing laundry. You would think that after years of cartoons featuring moms being known for more than just outdated gender norms, there would have been more thought put into this character. I'm not saying she needs to be an SJW, but good lord, being a mom should be a detail of her character, not her entire personality. 
Am I being picky? Eh, potentially, but all I'm asking is that she does more than the same two basic things every time I see her on screen. This is her, like, 99% of the time. Think I'm exaggerating? Let's go through all the episodes in which her only appearance revolves around cooking or cleaning, shall we? At the time of this recording, I've watched all the way up to Terror at 20,000 Leagues. This episode is apparently the 8th one produced, but the 7th one aired. Alright, let's see. Episode 1A. She's seen near the beginning where she just finished cooking the family a delicious breakfast. In that very same episode near the end, she's now serving the family a trasher roll. Episode 2A. She goes out of her way to navigate a war zone within her own house just to give everyone jelly sandwiches. Episode 2B. She spends all of her screen time in the kitchen struggling to use a toaster. Episode 3A. Her screen time is spent searching for Patrick while trying to give him clean laundry. Episode 3B. Her screen time is used to interrupt a phonathon so that she can do a load of laundry. Episode 5B. Her screen time is spent cleaning their aggressively sentient toilet, and in episode 8 she's introduced outside painting the laundry. I... I don't know, don't... don't ask. Outside of that, she spends the rest of the episode being mind controlled. Now at this point you might be saying, hey it's just the first few episodes, maybe she has an episode that doesn't only have her cooking or cleaning in the near future. Well, going off the episode descriptions for Wikipedia, we do have an episode coming out in the near future called Bunny the Barbarian. What is it about? Her fighting a dust bunny as she cleans the house. <laughs> God, this is so sad. If she was meant to be a minor or secondary character, someone like Dexter's mom, then I wouldn't care. That'd be fine. But if this show is trying to convince me that she's actually part of the main cast, you know, a character I'm supposed to care about, then she needs to be represented in a far less generic way. I think the most notable thing she's done so far is interrupt a staircase war between Patrick and his grandpa, all just to give them jelly sandwiches. Like woo, imagine an alternate timeline where the show didn't exist, we'd be missing out on such a great and useful character. Setting Patrick's mom aside, up next we have Patrick's grandpa. Don't worry, I don't have a long tangent on him. I think outside of the episode Star Wars, he again doesn't do too much in the series, but is, at the very least, far less egregious than Patrick's mom. The grandpa certainly falls into your typical grumpy old man trope, often complaining about how much harder things were when he was growing up. Though he does provide a little bit of a twist to this trope, given that a lot of his stories take place across different time periods, implying he's, uh, been alive for a while. <laughs> Which I personally think is kind of funny, and it never makes his stories feel too bland. My only complaint around him is that there seems to be this recurring joke that comes up a couple times where the family just flat out forgets who he is, and so the poor guy has to remind them that he's the grandpa. And just like the grandpa, this joke gets really old really fast. Lastly, we have Squidina, who is probably the best character to come out of this show. She mostly spends her time helping Patrick film and produce his TV show. And even though that's the only thing she's kind of known for, when written well, it can really help her character shine and offer something that's actually entertaining. Her desperation to always find something to film and try to keep Patrick's in-world TV show fresh is a nice change of pace that works well with the show's premise. And I think an episode like Squidina's Little Helper is a prime example of this, where it shows the great length she's willing to go to produce this show and keep Patrick focused while filming. It shows us that having to improv your production based on the fleeting thought Patrick will have for the next two seconds can get extremely exhausting, and thus she hires a second hand to help her produce the show. And so this episode kind of acts as a day in the life of Squidina, which I thought was a neat episode and makes me want to see more punchlines and jokes delivered by her. Unfortunately though, while I do enjoy Squidina's character, her character alone just isn't enough to save this show. Like I alluded to earlier, my feelings toward this show varies between hatred and enjoyment depending on the episode, but mostly towards hatred. Each episode feels like a series of random events with a plot in the middle, but the episode never actually commits to a story of any substance, and so by the time an episode ends, you feel like nothing really happened. And that's kind of the common trend you'll see in most episodes. They just don't go anywhere. Take the episode Bummer Jobs for example. Here Patrick learns what a job is before his parents leave for work, as I guess they have never gone to work before. His mom describes a job as something that gives you purpose, and so he and Spongebob spend the day doing various jobs around town. Hijinks ensue with each job they do, and at the end of each job, Patrick asks if he's found his purpose. Which initially is a pretty profound question, but in the end, this ultimately doesn't mean anything when he simply starts doing a show again and says he suddenly found his purpose. What gave him that conclusion? The heck if I know. The last we saw him, he was hired by Squidward to collect money for the town paper. And when that didn't work out, he just says, Yep, being on TV is my purpose. Um, oh, okay, you, you wanna elaborate on that? It just felt like such a cop-out ending because there weren't any moments that explained his reasoning for why this TV show was his purpose. 
there's nothing that indicates how he came to that conclusion. If you wanted the ending to actually lead up to Patrick finding a purpose through his TV show, then you just need like, one small scene of him doing something on a show that entertained his usual crowd. He would see the enjoyment on their faces, then come to the realization, wow, people really like my show, and I really love doing it. I think I found my purpose. And then bam, that would be the episode. That would give us some event that was actually relevant to the ending. And I get that Patrick is an idiot, but you don't have to turn him into a genius to come to that realization. Or better yet, you can get Squidina to realize that for him. Both routes are pretty plausible. Which, speaking of Squidina, this show had an episode that just completely screwed her over and threw all of her hard work right out the window. What episode am I referring to? Why it's none other than Squidina's Little Helper. Now you might be saying, wait Zero, didn't you just praise that episode? And I'd say, yes, yes I did. But there's one major flaw with how this episode ends. The episode goes as follows. We see how much effort Squidina puts into getting Patrick ready and filming the show. It becomes apparent that this is exhausting for her, and so she decides to hire an assistant. After a montage of job applicants, she ends up hiring Fenton Finkel, a kid who looks like something you'd get if Mr. Krabs and Spongebob had a baby. Squidina spends the day showing him the ins and outs of how to run the show. The show goes smoothly and runs successfully. The Star family goes to bed, but then wakes up to discover that all their belongings had been stolen. They later find out it was Fenton who stole all of Squidina's equipment to make his own TV show for his sister, which, I won't lie, that definitely caught me off guard, because there was never a point where I felt like Fenton had malicious intent to sabotage the show, but when you look back on it, it kinda makes sense, so like, well done. From there, the Star family finds Fenton's house, who actually just lives across the street, and they rush in to stop him by destroying all of the stolen equipment. But by the time they're done, we learn that Fenton's show was picked up by the network and is set to go for six seasons. Oh, and by the way, since the family destroyed the stolen equipment that was actually Squidina's, it's safe to assume it'll be quite a while before she can film another episode of Patrick's show. After seeing this, my initial thought was, oh man, well now Squidina and the family have to take some time to get back at Fenton. But when you look at the runtime, you realize you're already at the end of the episode. This was the ending the show thought it should leave you with. Now, to be fair, in the last 30 seconds of the episode, the family is seen in the living room watching Fenton's show, with Squidina looking super depressed, and so in an effort to cheer her up, Patrick drops in their aggressively sentient toilet into Fenton's show to chase them around, and then that's the end. They shoehorned in this ending as if everything worked out in the end, but really, I can't help but feel bad for Squidina. The one person she trusted to help her with making this show ended up stealing her equipment and show idea and turned it into something that became six times more successful than everything she's worked for thus far, all across a span of just 24 hours. Now some might say, well they were attacked by the toilet in the end so Fenton got his rightful punishment, and I'd say sure but did he really though? Because ask yourself, which kid would you rather be in this situation? The one who got both their TV show and equipment stolen by someone they trusted, which was later destroyed, or the kid who stole the TV show and equipment, was picked up for six seasons, and then embarrassed on TV for a few seconds? Because ten times out of ten, I'm picking the latter option. There's nothing indicating his show got cancelled after the toilet incident, so while this may be a small bump in the road, you're still going to go on to be super successful. No matter how you look at it, this episode did Squidina dirty. Plain and simple. Hashtag justice for Squidina. Setting that aside, outside of extremely loose plots and questionable endings, the show likes to do these random little skits and segments that happen in the middle of the episode, despite it being irrelevant to what the episode is even about. I imagine the purpose of these is to make the series feel like a variety show with different segments, but personally it all just feels like filler to me, as if the show can't handle focusing on Patrick for 11 minutes straight, so it has to be filled with random events just to pad out time. And I should mention, these aren't subplots or anything of substance, these are just self-contained one-off events. They might sometimes refer to what Patrick is doing in the current episode, but they don't really affect the plot in any way. One of the most common segments we've seen thus far is this 3D Spongebob Frankenstein stuff. I, I do think it's really well animated, but outside of that, I don't know what else to say. It's just Plankton being annoyed by Spongebob and Patrick for two minutes straight. I guess if they were seen annoying Squidward in the spinoff, people would think they're watching Spongebob again, so we gotta mix it up to keep things different. But even if I were to enjoy these segments, why are most of them filled with original Spongebob characters instead of, you know, the new characters that were created solely for this spinoff? If I wanted to focus on Spongebob characters, I would just go and watch Spongebob. <laughs> or is a plot around Patrick and his family really that boring? 
in addition to these one-off scenes, the show likes to go for a lot of random jokes, some of which don't even work in a comedic context. Like in literally the first episode, sometimes when Patrick opens a door at random, we'll see this knight running down the hallway trying to kill him. What is supposed to be funny about this? How am I supposed to react? They use this joke three times, twice during the actual episode and then once near the end credits. I think the joke should have only been used once and it's during this scene. I think the milk went bad. Patrick's response here is what makes it funny in this instance. Doing it any other time outside of this just feels pointless. And I'm not mad at the fact that the show uses random jokes. Spongebob certainly has a good amount of them, but they're often well-timed and used sparingly. Whereas the Patrick show consistently relies on its jokes coming from randomness as one-off gags, as opposed to jokes coming up naturally in the plot. Obviously, this show wouldn't be the first that uses this style of writing, with Uncle Grandpa being a notable example. But let's say your show uses randomness as part of the plot. I think that's a fine alternative too. Popular shows like Adventure Time and Regular Show have incorporated randomness into their plots plenty of times and was still met with great success. But when your show has plots that don't go anywhere, does injecting it with randomness really do anything for it? Or does it just turn everything into a giant mess? An episode like Enemies a la Mode is a prime example of this where after a day of filming, Squidina tries to provide a recap for the episode. While the scene was meant to be used as a gag, all this really told me was how chaotic this show's structure and focus can be at times. When the plot took you in just so many different directions, not even the intelligent character could tell you what the episode was actually about. If you watch the episode, the show tried to convince you that it was about enemies, but really it's just a series of one party being annoyed by the other. Saying that two parties are enemies implies that both sides are actively trying to antagonize or thwart each other. You know, something like the rivalry between Plankton and Mr. Krabs, which outside of Ouchie and this bunny, that was never really the case. For the most part, the episode was nothing but the ice cream man trying to run away from Patrick all day, as apparently Patrick turns into a gluttonous ball of destruction every time he eats ice cream. So if you were ever tired of Spongebob episodes about Patrick's abhorrent eating behavior, don't worry fam, this spinoff has got you covered. Randomness aside, I think the biggest thing this show initially confused me on was the point in time this series was supposed to take place. Does this take place in the present day with modern Spongebob? Is this in the past, or is this an alternate timeline? I just couldn't tell. In the Bummer Jobs episode, which is the second segment of episode 1, Spongebob decides to get involved after Patrick asks if he'd like to join him in a job search, to which Spongebob says this confusing line. What a coincidence! I can also use a job! Because I'm a little low on lettuce and I need some scratch for spatulas, see? It's not a coincidence, Spongebob. So, are you hinting that this is the present day, in which you currently work at the Krusty Krab and need a side job to buy a new spatula? Or is this a prequel in which you're unemployed and need money for a spatula so that you can work at the Krusty Krab? I assume he doesn't work at the Krusty Krab yet, as Squidward's main job here in this spinoff is being a paperboy. And we all know Squidward had been working at the restaurant years before Spongebob joined, so given that information, my first assumption was that this was a prequel, given that along with his new job, Squidward was redesigned to have acne on his nose, and Spongebob was given a new hairdo. Or he was just given hair in general? Spongebob doesn't have hair? Or does he? So, going off of that, I was assuming that this took place during the Spongebob gang's teenage years, and after looking around online, I found confirmation that this was, in fact, a prequel. I think the show just didn't know how to indicate that outside of slight changes in character designs, as if giving Sandy glasses would indicate that she's younger or something. <laughs> but honestly, I don't blame them too much on that front. I imagine their teenage designs wouldn't look all that different from their adult ones unless we want to stick with this. Which, uh, <clears throat> no thank you. Okay, okay. I think I'm done venting about this show. This next segment is <laughs> significantly shorter than the one I just did, but it's still worth going over anyway. Let's talk about the things I actually like about this show. Believe it or not, they do exist. Alright, let's start with the show's premise. If I'm being honest, I think giving this spinoff the format of a talk show was a pretty good idea. I'm sure many of you have ideas of alternative formats this show could have taken, that being non-existent, but really, my only requirement for this was, just make it different from Spongebob. <laughs> that's, that's literally it. 
No one is going to be interested in a spinoff about Patrick if it's just going to be a cheap Spongebob clone, but only from Patrick's perspective. And so I like this talk show format because you can base your episode plots around a single topic that can be broken down into different segments and expanded upon as you go along, which is essentially what the show is trying to do, but with varying degrees of success. For example, Enemies a la Mode isn't really about enemies as the name would suggest, or at least it's not as accurate as the name would suggest. Whereas The Haunting of Star House is more true to its name, since it's actually about ghosts attempting to haunt their house. Regardless, I'd say the two episodes that work best with this talk show-like format are Squidina's Little Helper and Lost in Couch. I'm not going to linger on Squidina's Little Helper for too long here, since I've already touched upon that earlier in the video. The big takeaway is, despite me hating the ending, I really like the behind the scenes element this episode provided, and being able to observe the Patrick show from a production perspective is what made it feel unique compared to other episodes, and so I'll leave it at that. In terms of an episode I actually liked from beginning to end, let's talk about Lost in Couch. In my opinion, this is the best episode that's aired thus far and shows the somewhat small potential this show has in actually being entertaining. What's the premise? Patrick loses the remote in his couch. It's an extremely simple idea, but I really like how the show handles it. In search of his remote, Patrick dives into the inside of his couch, which ends up unraveling into this wild and bizarre furniture habitat. And since this search is still considered a segment of the Patrick Show episode Squidina is trying to film, she basically hands him the camera and turns it into a survival TV show, with her often checking in on him as he documents his journey. Something similar to Man vs. Wild. And while one could ask, how dangerous can this search be, it's just a TV remote. What we soon find out is that inside this couch, the remote was given sentience as if it were a wild animal, having Patrick refer to it as a remoto dragon. As the search goes on, we later learn that he has access to other furniture such as his dresser or Bubble Bass's couch, which this appearance, in my opinion, is the proper way to handle cameos of Spongebob characters without giving them too much screen time, but I digress. As Patrick's search continues, Houdina ends up losing track of him, and while she is worried, it turns out she's more concerned with the episode footage being lost over Patrick's actual well-being, which really highlights her dedication to the show and plays well into her character, showing us that she cares for the show as if it were her own child. It's something she's put her entire heart and soul into, and so that just makes sense. Soon, she starts sending town citizens into the couch in a desperate search for Patrick, something akin to what we've seen in the Spongebob episode Pre-Hibernation Week, where Sandy sends the entire town out to look for Spongebob when he starts hiding from her without her knowledge. I'm not going to do an entire play-by-play -play of the rest of Lost in Couch, but hopefully you get the gist of what it's going for. Overall, it really reminds me of the Gumball episode The Routine, where Richard has to go on this crazy quest all just to pick up a jar of mayo from the store. And so, I like the Patrick Show's take on this kind of idea, especially with the survival television aspect of it. Another part of the show I like are Grandpa's stories, or at least, the art direction behind them. Each time he tells a story, the show always switches its art style to match the theme of that story. Like in Enemies a la Mode, where he talks about how ice cream used to be prohibited back in the day. This was a clear reference to the prohibition of alcohol that began in the 1920s. I really like the art style behind the story, as it was done in the style of Max Fleischer, the creator of Betty Boop and many other works, all of which were popular during this time period. So it was really cool to see this show's take on that art style. Plus, I always like it when a show changes its art style for small segments like this. The Amazing World of Gumball did that pretty often, and I've always enjoyed it, so it's certainly welcome here as well. While the 3D Spongebob Frankenstein stuff is done in a similar manner, I still have a preference toward Grandpa's stories, as these segments have always either added to the episode's plot, or is at least still relevant to the plot, instead of feeling like their own isolated segments, which these 3D parts generally do. I just don't think the isolated segments work too well for 11 minute episodes, or at least not if you're doing them all the time. It just feels like filler for an already pretty short episode. Moving on from there though, many of the jokes in the show missed the mark for me, but I'd be completely lying if I said I didn't find at least some of them funny. Because when they do get a laugh out of me, it's either because I thought the joke was clever or it was a random joke that came out of nowhere, but still falls in line with what the episode is actually about. Something like the random jokes we'd get in the golden seasons of Spongebob. Even some of the episode titles are pretty clever, such as Star Wars or The Haunting of Star House. I found one of the most clever jokes to be in Late for Breakfast, the first episode. At the beginning of the episode, Patrick's mom cooks up a meal for the family, as she does, that actually looks delectable. 
But then later, near the end, she's seen feeding the family a horrendous dish called a trasher roll, a recipe she says she learned from a TV show she was watching earlier. While at first glance it may look like all of her cooking skills have been thrown out the window in the span of 11 minutes, when you put two and two together, you realize she had gotten this recipe from a cooking segment Patrick did on his show just moments earlier, in which he threw in a bunch of garbage together into a casserole dish as an attempt to make his own meal after missing breakfast. It's a pretty clever joke due to how the show doesn't spell out what show she was referencing because at no point did we see her actually watching Patrick's show. Either you got the joke at the time or you didn't. Plus, the episode's pacing doesn't come to a screeching halt just to tell you the joke. Unlike some episodes. So we meet again, eh? Who are you? I'm the one who's gonna make you wish I wasn't your grandpa. Wait, I know you! <laughs> Bruh, Patrick is in the middle of a war with his grandpa. Who thought it would be funny to derail the pacing just for the stupid recurring I don't remember my grandpa joke? Oh my goodness. Alright look, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna level with you here. I know this section is supposed to be about what I enjoy in this show, but it's just so hard to do when I run into annoying stuff like this. Truth be told, I think this show can be clever when it wants to, but can also be really stupid when it wants to. And most of the time, it likes to be really stupid. I think all I'm just asking for is just more consistency with the show focusing on the plot at hand, what kind of jokes it wants to tell, and when to tell them. Because if there's a list of three things I don't like, it's one, making list, b, counting, and three, inconsistency. It sucks being able to see what this show is capable of, but not have it always meet that quality. Because I'll be honest, I'm one of the Spongebob fans who didn't want the spinoff to exist. But if it's still going to become a thing, I would still like for it to be good. I want it to become something that's worth watching, something people didn't think was a disgrace to Hellenberg's legacy. Which leads me to my final thoughts. Overall, I am not all that crazy about this show. While I appreciate some of the attempts it makes with its experimental story structure, randomly outlandish jokes, and overall premise, it still leaves a lot to be desired. Not to mention, outside of Squadina's character, this show has yet to give me a reason why I should even acknowledge the rest of Patrick's family as main characters, especially his parents. I just need a stronger presence or more involvement from them in future episodes. Speaking of which, back in August of this year, Nickelodeon has ordered an additional 13 episodes for the series, rounding the series out to a total of 26 episodes produced, all of which I'm assuming are going to be considered under Season 1. While my thoughts on the show aren't all that positive, one can only hope that these next batch of episodes show some improvement, because like I said before, I didn't want this spinoff to exist, but if it's going to, I would like it to at least be something I can consistently enjoy. Because currently, the reception toward this show is overwhelmingly negative, and if this keeps up, the show may end up lasting only one season. But let's be honest, if it really did end there, would anyone actually miss it? Alright peeps, I think that'll be all for today. What are your thoughts on the Patrick Star Show? Did you love it? Did you hate it? What would you rate it? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I think this has been my longest review to date, so if you made it this far, then thank you, I appreciate the company. <laughs> As always, if you enjoyed the video, feel free to leave a like as it lets me and YouTube know that you're enjoying the content. And if you want to see more videos like this, then be sure to smash that subscribe button, just be sure to get consent before you do. I hope you're all doing well, and with that, I shall see you all next time.